Hi, I'm Suze Moore and welcome to my writing shed where today we have Minnie joining us. She's a little cold because it's a cold, windy day um, here in the UK. And we are going to continue with Nat Walker's adventure in Emerald Secret, which is the second book in my Nat Walker series. And Nat is in London with her robot dragon Fizz. And they've just been to the terrible Ivy Shiversand for afternoon tea, where Ivy wielded a sword in the hope of finding everlasting youth. So today we begin with chapter 12, Jamuka. Jamuka is Nat's guardian. Nat didn't stop running until her boots landed on the deck of the Junko. Fizz was flying along just in front of her. He'd navigated the shortest road route back to St Catherine Docks and was now opening the boat's main hatch so that she could run straight inside. She found Jamuka in the kitchen galley drinking Vietnamese weasel coffee and frowning at his fast pad. Gobi spotted Fizz and started chirping at him from her cage. Oh yeah, this is the worst day ever, she said, tossing her hat on the galley counter. She kicked off her boots and pulled off her jacket and skirt. The pin-tucked white shirt reached her knees like a dress. Our pink had left a jug, a, a jug of cherry juice out. She poured some into a glass and gulped it down in one go. Jamuka still hadn't looked up from his fast pad. Hello, she said, tapping him on the shoulder. He jumped and looked up over his half-moon glasses. Bow bow, sorry, I, I was watching Dragon Khan's last race. Today was worse than being put in a box full of snakes. Please, please, can we go back home, she said. Jamuka took off his glasses and rubbed the bridge of his nose. This is our home for the next two years. The first day at a new school is often the hardest. It's not the school. I hate it, but it wasn't as bad as tea with the Baroness. Even though she knows, I mean, you, Mum and Dad. Jamuka frowned. She was at Boxbury with Dad. She was a geek just like him, but she's mad. She runs Warsworld and thinks she's a queen. I had to watch her weird crowning ceremony with some ancient sword. Jamuka's hand shot out. He squeezed her arm. Wait, w uh, slow down. You said a sword. She stopped. His eyes were now fixed on hers. Yes, some ancient sword. She said mum knew all about ancient swords, did she? Jamuka didn't reply straight away. Instead, he turned to her little dragon. Fizz, activate a full security sweep on board and close all access points, including portholes. Aye, aye. Captain, said Fizz, saluting with his wing before flying out of the kitchen. The two portholes whirred closed above the sink. So it's Jamuka, what are you doing? Jamuka held his finger to her li his lips. He took her hand and headed for the door. Nat followed him, her heart thudding, as he led her to the dojo. They sat down, cross-legged in the centre of the mat. The door opened and Fizz tiptoed in, his talons making light, rasping sounds as he crossed the jigsaw matting to where they were sitting. He climbed up Nat's arm and perched on her shoulder, nuzzling his warm snout into the nape of her neck. Perimeter is secured, he announced. Thank you, said Jamuka. Now, Bao Bao, you and Fizz need to tell me everything that happened from the moment you left Boxbury with Saskia. Nat opened her mouth to speak, but was stopped short by a loud snort from Fizz. I have a confession to make, said Fizz. How very human of you. Fizz, said Jamuka. 
Fizz's eyes flash purple. I decided to film everything from the moment we left Boxbury using my stealth system X150. Nat turned to look at him on her shoulder. You're what? He swooped down onto the mat, opened his wings and activated his screen. My stealth system X150. I downloaded it from Spytastic three days ago on a trial basis. I thought I'd give it a go and then convince you to purchase the full version, including the night vision option. Hoxo's poodle head appeared, filling Fizz's screen. In the background, Saskia could be heard asking her nosy questions. I started to use it because I wanted to check out the poodle. It can't do as much as me. Nat felt a surge of love for her dragon. Zoinks, he was clever. She reached down and patted his head. He looked up at her, his snout and eyes blazing purple. At least they were in this together. The film cut off when they exited Shivasan Tower's gates at top speed. Jamuka got to his feet and started to pace up and down the mat, his head bent low, hands clasped behind his back. Your mother was an ancient weaponry expert. That was how she met your father. She was lecturing at SOAS here in London. Your father attended her lecture and it was love at first sight. But, but you said they met at a party said Nat. That was because they wanted to protect you until the time was right. Nat frowned. From what? Until what? Jamuka stopped pacing and stood looking out across the dock. From this kind of thing. I must go to Shiver Sand Towers now and sort this out. Sort what out? said Nat. He turned round to face her. The sword that Ivy is searching for. She wants it for the wrong reason. It'll never do what she wants. I need to tell her that. I need her to leave you alone. He was already striding towards the door. I'll come with you, said Nat, following him into the corridor. He stopped at the main hatch and turned to her. This is something I must do alone, Bao Bao. I'll be back later. Fizz? Keep the junko secured. He put his arms around Nat and gave her a hug. There is much I must teach you, but not yet, he said. Chapter 13. Fairy tale. When is calling, announced Fizz, tapping her on the shoulder with a talon. Nat opened her eyes. She must have fallen asleep on her bunk. Her cabin was bathed in a yellow glow from the dockside light that was shining in through the window. Oh, take it, she said, yawning. Fizz hopped around on her pillow and spread his wings. Wen appeared on the screen along with Nat's cousin Henry. Both of them were in wayward school uniform, sitting at the marble top kitchen counter at Wen's house on the peak in Hong Kong. Behind them, through the panoramic window, she could see clear blue sky, sunshine and the tips of skyscrapers that were clustered down below in the central district. She wished she were with them. Henry's freckled face leaned into camera. Are you still in bed? he asked. Wen shoved him out of the way. I, of course she is. I told you about the time difference in London. It's the middle of the night. We are waking her up. Henry tapped his squirrel robot's nose. Nutnet flicked his tail, held up a union jack, opened his mouth and began to sing the national anthem. Wen reached over, grabbed Nutnut and twisted the ear and the squirrel shut its mouth and the music came to a stop. Hey! I taught Nut Nut that specially for Nat. Nat smiled. 
She hadn't spoken with Henry for a few days because he'd had to go on a trip to Shanghai with Uncle Fergal and Prissy. They'd been to collect Aunt Vera from her clinic and no robots had been allowed. Thanks, Henry, she said. I agree it is nice, said Wen, ruffling Henry's red hair. But hang on. She picked up a can of concrete hairspray, aimed it at the front quiff she created with Henry's fringe and blasted it with spray. Henry pushed her away and started coughing from the fog. That's ding. I'll make you fashionable yet, Henry Walker, said Wen, admiring her own work. She looked back into camera. Now, on the serious business of the hour, we've watched the Fizz film, and who is that crazy queen and her daughter? Is this some kind of dramedy show you shot? No, it's not. It's real, said Nat. Wen and Henry both looked at each other and looked back at Nat and leaned into camera, searching Nat's face for a hint of a smile as if it was a joke. It's not a joke, said Henry. No, no joke, it's real. Silence. The queen, the sword, the crown, the girl dressed like Mary Poppins. It's all really for real, said Wen. Yes, it seems there's something to do with my parents and a sword and it's all hush hush secret. Jamuka's gone over to the crazy queen's house to talk to her about it. <whistles> Wen whistled. Henry frowned. I wish I were with you, he said. Me too, said Nat. Or oh, I wish I'd never had to come here and I was still in Hong Kong with you. Zoinks, Jamuka says he's loads to teach me, but not yet. And I don't even know what's planned for me by then. In the meantime, I've got to go to a school where no one speaks to me because the headmaster has told them all I'm some special heiress. <clears throat> Ahem, interrupted Fizz in a very English accent, a accent. Not quite no one. We have both formed acquaintances, myself with Vesperetta and you with Zixen. Ding, accent fizz. I must download that for foo. Do they make it for super fresh and furry robots? Asked Wen. I'll send you the... Stop, said Nat, interrupting. This is serious. That's why I sent you the film. My life is big, major, massive pants. At least you haven't got my mum, said Henry, even though she's been in a clinic or sanatorium, as she calls it, for months. She's not really come back any nicer. I think she's even more grumpy. She stays in all the time and won't get anywhere and says it's because we're poor. An image of Aunt Vera screaming across the courtroom flashed through Nat's mind. True, but my parents are running my life from the grave. Why can't I just be left alone? Wen shrugged. I don't know, Nat. Make Jamuka tell you the truth. It sounds as if you'll need to if people like the crazy queen are after you. And who are Vesperetta and Zixen? Vesperetta is a robot snake. She belongs to this boy, Zixen, who sits next to me in class and he's got a weird forked tongue. Ding, send me a picture, please, said Wen. A loud ringing echoed across Wen's kitchen. Henry groaned. School, do we have to go, he moaned. Wen jumped down off her stool. Yes, we do, right now, otherwise I'll get a detention again. She picked up her slider helmet and put it on. Like the new paint job, said Wen, modelling it for the camera. Nat laughed. Her friend had printed out the blue and gold Boxbury School crest with the pig's head and stuck it on the front. Henry was wearing his helmet now and he'd got the same paint job. We wanted to make sure you didn't feel alone there, said Henry. 
she gave him a thumbs up. I hope Jamuka sorts it all out. Remember to get him to tell you the truth. You deserve to know. Zula, over and out, said Wen, cutting the call. Nat yawned and moved down her bunk to rest her head on her pillow. I was tired as a million year old dog. Wake me up at seven, please, Fizz. Affirmative, my lady, said Fizz. But she was awake again by five. Fizz was in power down sleep mode, so she decided to leave him and have a moment to herself. She walked out onto the deck and found it to find it shrouded in a layer of fog. She could hear the mournful squawk of seagulls flying overhead and the low roar of early morning traffic crossing Tower Bridge. The large brass clock on the main dock warehouse chimed. She looked at the upper deck, expecting to see Jamuka there, cross-legged, deep in his morning meditation. But it was deserted. He must still be asleep. She shivered in her thin tiger print pyjamas. If London was this cold now, she dreaded to think what winter was going to be like. No wonder her parents had moved to Hong Kong. She reached back inside the hatch and unhooked Jamuka's grey Mongolian coat off the peg and pulled it on, and the soft fur lining warmed her skin. A smell of freshly baked bread wafted over the water, making her stomach growl. Breakfast. She checked the pockets of the coat, and her fingers curled around a handful of English coins. Perfect. No need to wake Fizz to come, to, to come with her to pay. She could go on her own, no questions, no chatting. She started to walk across the deck towards the gangway, but as her feet met with the damp, fog-slicked planks, she realised she'd forgotten to put on her boots. She turned to head back to the cabin when she caught sight of the top of the launch dinghy. Perfect, no shoes required. She crossed to the rail climbed over and jumped aboard. The cables whirred into action, lowering the dinghy, and it hit the murky water with a splash. She took hold of the tiller and twisted. The motor purred into action, propelling her forward. Wait for me! She looked up and sighed. Fizz, his emerald green wings fully spread, was flying towards her at top speed. He swooped down, coming into land on her shoulder. Where are we going? Nat slowed the motor. Here. Fizz put his snout up into the air and inhaled. Yeast, flour, sugar, baked at 180 degrees centigrade, he announced. Oh, don't ruin it for me, she said. She picked up the mooring rope and tied it to a metal ladder set into the wall and climbed up to the quay. The cobbles were cold and slippery under her bare feet. She dashed across them to the bakery, at the long coat dragging behind her. The bell on the bakery door tinkled as she ran inside, and the woman behind the counter looked up and smiled. Morning! You look like you've come out of a fairy tale! Nat caught sight of herself in the mirror opposite. Her red hair was unbrushed, slept on, wild. She got Fizz perched on her shoulder and Jamuka's coat looked like some medieval cloak. She blushed with embarrassment, feeling out of place, alien again. The woman fished out a warm croissant from the counter, placed it on a napkin and handed it to her. It's on the house. We were inundated with hungry tourists yesterday who were here just to see your boat. Nat smiled and bowed her head. Thank you. The woman looked out of the window across the dock. So what's all that grey stuff on it? Are you trying to hide? Nat followed her gaze. From where they were standing, the junco looked unreal, more of a ghost boat than a real one. 
We want to fit in, be below the radar. It's a security blanket. The woman chuckled and raised an eyebrow. You've got a green dragon on your shoulder. You look like a medieval princess and you live on an ancient ship. Fit in, you say? Ha ha ha. And that is the end of chapter 13. I think that's a good place to stop for today. And I hope you've enjoyed the story. I think Minnie's sound asleep here, very comfortable under the blanket. I shall look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you again for joining me. Bye-bye.